In today's modern world, one nation can attack another at the push of a button. But for many years, warfare was not so easy. You actually had to send troops via land, sea, or air to attack someone. Because of this, the United States began to seriously fortify its coastland in the late 1800s. And naturally, the bigger the city, the higher the chance of attack, and thus the higher amount of defenses. The Endicott Board was created in 1885 with the express purpose of modernizing and creating fortifications across the country, which were in operation until the end of World War II. San Francisco was deemed as the most important Pacific port and second most strategic in all of America, just behind New York. Work began in 1891, and less than a decade later, the Spanish-American and Philippine-American wars broke, prompting an increased military spending on the West Coast. Dozens of batteries and forts sprung up across San Francisco's coast during this time. These posts began to be abandoned in the 1940s and were completely empty by the 1970s. Today, most of these have been preserved by the National Park Service, and you can take a hike along the coast through these batteries, which is exactly what we'll be doing in this week's video as we check out the San Francisco batteries of Fort Winfield Scott. One of a number of forts around SF, Fort Winfield Scott was established in 1912 in the Presidio District to serve as an artillery post guarding the city. It contained roughly 63 guns across 15 batteries. It was also used as a base of operations during the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge, which cut directly through the fort's land. The campus consists primarily of 10 barracks surrounding the parade grounds, which are the first mission revival style buildings built, the style now synonymous with nearly all buildings in the Presidio. Up until the end of World War II, this was the headquarters for almost all of their forts surrounding San Francisco. Post closure in 1946, the Army Coastal Artillery School moved into the fort but it was short lived, as within four years the training was obsolete and closed. In 1981, the 504th Military Police Battalion was housed there and finally in 1995 the fort was given to the National Park Service. Since then, they have been working to restore the campus, which is estimated to cost over $200 million. But let's head south and start at Battery Chamberlain. Beginning construction in 1903, Battery Chamberlain featured four 6-inch M1903 guns behind a reinforced concrete bunker. Named after Lowell Chamberlain, a Civil War artillery captain, the battery was completed in 1904 at a cost of just over $100,000. It operated until 1917, but was then reactivated three years later and operated until closing in 1948. The first thing visitors will notice is the 6 inch disappearing gun that remains in place. When the batteries were closed, all guns were removed, however, after being donated by the Smithsonian in 1977, this gun was reinstalled and is the only one of its kind that remains on the entire west coast. Named because of the way the gun can rotate and be lowered back into its pit when being reloaded, the majority of Fort Scott's batteries consisted of these types of artillery. Two days a month, the Park Service holds a test demonstration and opens the underground carriage room. Let's head north up to Battery Crosby. The most isolated of all batteries we will be visiting today, you must take a trail down the bluffs to access the fortification. Beginning construction in 1899, this two-gun battery remained active all the way up until 1943. The lower level held the magazines for the guns, which were brought up to the upper level by a hand-cranked hoist.
The 1906 earthquake in San Francisco caused some damage to this battery, reportedly creating a horizontal crack across almost the entire structure's length. The guns in this battery were from the Endicott era and were never updated like most others during World War I, and just two years into World War II, the battery was declared obsolete. Sitting above the bluff, almost behind Crosby, is Battery Saffold. Named after War Department General Marion M. Saffold, the first gun was installed in 1896, and the final gun arrived two years later. A unique feature of this battery was that it was able to fire both into the ocean and into the bay, until eventually the growing trees and new buildings at the Presidio blocked the bay from them. Unfortunately, the battery is in the grounds behind Fort Scott in the gated off section being used by the Park Service for storage. I was, however, able to find these photos of the battery back when it was accessible. Next up is another wooded battery, where the former Presidio Battery West was located. This 1873 battery was almost entirely demolished to make way for the Endicott area batteries we will be visiting next, and I suspect this building was a part of those. Possibly an anti-air or radar addition. Previous to World War II, the threat by air was non-existent. But by the 1940s, air attack was a real possibility and required the army to make major additions to their defenses. Batteries were camouflaged and had additional rapid fire anti-aircraft guns installed. Before we go any closer to the bridge, let's take a quick jaunt further inland to battery Howe Wagner. Unlike the other batteries, Howe Wagner is hidden underneath a massive undergrowth and most passerby assume it's just a hill. Starting in 1893, mortar batteries Howe and Wagner originally consisted of two pits each, which contained 16 mortar artillery until joined together in 1906 to form two large mortar pits. Got to get through all these prickers just to see in there. That's the problem. It's very dark as well, so you can't really see. By 1920, the mortars were largely scrapped and all but one pit was covered with dirt. That remaining pit we see here has been used as storage ever since. Returning to the coast, we come upon Battery Godfrey, the first of the remaining four batteries bunched together near the entrance to the bay. This was the first 12-inch gun battery in the entire United States, beginning construction in 1892 and completed in 1896. Though similar in design to Battery Chamberlain, Battery Godfrey featured three barbette artillery, which were a precursor to the disappearing guns. Rather than lower, the barbette gun simply retracted back from the wall. A wine bottle right there. Somebody was having a party in vodka. Wine. Both barbette and disappearing guns were active until being replaced during World War I, and those that were not upgraded, such as Battery Godfrey, were declared obsolete during the Second World War and closed. The guns and cartridges were salvaged for their metal in 1943. 
This building is another remainder from the military and stands remarkably intact. These coastal batteries across San Francisco are regarded as some of the best preserved World War II era fortifications in the United States. Side note, if you've never been to San Francisco, it has one of the highest property crimes in the country. Something I witnessed here where some people left their car for just a short time and had a backpack stolen from it. The Battery Botel featured three balanced pillar guns installed in 1901. Similar to the disappearing gun mounts, a balanced pillar mount could remain invisible until ready to fire. All three guns were declared necessary for use in Europe and sent over in 1918. Patel was never rearmed. Along this trail, I began to see tons of tourists coming to take the great sights of the Golden Gate Bridge. And sadly, most of them have no interest in these old structures they are passing by. We are now atop Battery Miller, which was originally a part of Battery Cranston just to the north. In fact, when it was first built in 1891, it was simply named Battery Cranston II. But the three guns of Battery Miller were eventually split off from the two that remained in Cranston. Miller operated until 1918, while Cranston operated until 1945. Today, Battery Cranston has been converted into maintenance offices and workshops by the Golden Gate Bridge and Transportation District and is strictly off limits. I was, however, able to sneakily go about Battery Miller. Interestingly, while most of these have their lower levels closed to keep out vandals and the homeless, this one was open. So there's definitely a fresh smell of manure down in here, so somebody must have been staying here recently. Is that a pumpkin? It's been smashed. Yep. Tons of graffiti. Spray paint. I got these pretty sealed. The last stop on our tour is the iconic Fort Point. The oldest of the locations we have visited today, the first military encampment base here was built in 1794 by the first Spanish settlers in the area. The roughly 13 cannon adobe fort switched over to Mexico in 1835 after they gained independence from Spain. It was next captured by America when an amphibious assault was launched during the Mexican-American War in 1846. It was during this war when the Punta del Cantillo Blanco began to refer it as the Punta del Castillo, which roughly translated from English as Fort Point. There's just one thing that most history books neglect to mention about this glorious attack. The fort had no garrison inside it for almost a decade, meaning that though it had cannon inside, there were no troops to man them, and thus no resistance to the attack.
With the advent of the gold rush, it was decided that real protection was needed and army engineers began construction of Fort Point, Fort Alcatraz, and Fort Mason in 1853. The original name for the Spanish fort includes Cantillo Blanco, referring to the white cliff it was situated on. This cliff, however, was the first thing to go when Fort Point began construction, as the cannon would be too high to fire onto the approaching ships. 90 of the 100-foot cliff was removed. The fort was designed in what was known as a third system style seacoast fort, and though there are over 30 of these types of forts on the east coast, Fort Point is the only one of its kind on the west coast of the United States. So they must have had to light these in here because it was so friggin' dark. So these are what they had. You sure better be paying attention when you're walking down these stairs because if you went on this end, check that out. You can't even walk. Some old grandma's probably gonna tumble right down there one day. Almost 200 men, mostly unemployed miners, worked for eight years building Fort Point, completing it just in time for the advent of the Civil War and its first commander resigned from his post to join the Confederate Army that same year. You actually can see out this one. These outer walls measure seven feet thick. Check out how much erosion just blew through these. Completely eroded. The fort became the most elaborate fortification on the entire west coast, having places for as much as 200 cannons. It also included guardhouse cells, living quarters, and offices inside. It was on high alert throughout the Civil War, and though it never saw any action, a Confederate ship was actually on its way to attack when the war ended. It was decided the fort was obsolete soon after and was never again to be continuously occupied by the Army. With upgrades to the Endicott system along the coast, Fort Point's guns were all removed for scrap and the fort began use as a barracks. In 1913, the fort was preparing to become an army detention center before Alcatraz was ultimately selected for that purpose. When the Golden Gate Bridge was designed in the 1930s, it was planned to demolish the old fort, but the bridge was redesigned so that the fort may be saved, as Chief Engineer Joseph Strauss stated that it should be reserved and restored as a national monument. That preservation finally came in 1970 when President Nixon created the Fort Point National Historic Park.
this section sealed off. More officer quarters. The iconic fort has been utilized in movies and TV shows such as Vertigo, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, West Wing, and The Amazing Race. It's also been recreated in multiple video games like Watch Dogs 2, NBA Street, and Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, defenses along the western coast were on high alert. Throughout the war, there were only three attacks to the coastline, two in Oregon and one in Southern California. As warfare entered the modern age, coastal defenses became obsolete. Thankfully, these relics of the past are being preserved for future generations. So if you're ever in San Francisco, consider taking a hike along the scenic coastline and taking a look at her old batteries and forts.